I am your main man, Andrew Wood, and today, Barbarian Horde, I bring back you, Phil Bricotta, my satyr friend from the Glen. Uh, he's going to come here and answer questions about Mage 20, and he's going to tell us about other projects that he is working on, other projects to tantalize and tempt your RPG-loving mind. And we're going to go into that, and we're going to get deep in depth with a good friend here of the Barbarian Horde. Uh, Mr. Bricotta, would you be so kind as to uh, tell the people that might not know even what Mage is, to sort of give us a quick synopsis of Mage, of Mage 20, of, of how this uh, wonderful thing that we thought was a dead entity has come back via the spell Resurrection. Hmm. And I think that's a Life 5, <laughs> five, five spell, if I am not mistaken. So take it away. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, Sadoros Cobracado, a.k.a. Sater. Uh, anyway... So, for folks who aren't familiar with Mage, Mage the Ascension is essentially a, uh, a storytelling game about modern magic and the, the idea that your beliefs can and do change the world. That this is the core of the idea, which is that every, every character within Mage the Ascension is an agent of change, an agent of changing the world in good and sometimes frequently not so good ways. Uh, it was... Back in the uh, back in the 90s, when we began, it Mage was a uh, was an award-winning bestseller. Uh, went on to to have some uh, went on to have some interesting permutations before the uh, before the end of the 90s and early in the uh, early in 2000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that's a nice way of putting it. Um, but I like but nice. around, Dude, let the people know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, the uh, uh, the 20th anniversary editions of, uh, of the various World of Darkness games have been brought to you and are continuing to be brought to you by Onyx Path Productions, courtesy of Richard Thomas, who is one of the original White Wolf people, and the uh, and through the, the auspices of the fans, because it is this is a, a fan-supported company, and you guys are making things happen. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, Mage 20 turned into be a turned out to be a gargantuan piece of work. Uh, the the pre-cut version of it was over 600,000 words long. I ended up cutting it to just a sh just shy of 500,000 because 600,000 words was not publishable. It would break the spine of the book if we had released it at that size. So what we've ended up doing, or what we are in the process of doing, is turning the, the other material and a lot of material that I wanted to add into it into a series of other books. Those books have already been funded. I am in I, I, I'm deep in the middle of, of, of doing three of them at the moment, but from all from all accounts and from all uh, from all appraisals, Mage the Ascension looks to be a very very strong, very very popular game from you know for the foreseeable future. Uh, we've got at this point ten books or so in various stages of progress, and people are really people are very excited. Uh, the 20th or the the, the 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 quick start edition of the 20th anniversary uh, came out a few months ago. Actually, hang on, I will grab a copy of that from my handy bookshelf. And you can have a look right there at Phil's bookcase. You can see you know a lot of great titles. So those you're going to recognize right off the bat, I believe, definitely uh, some interesting stuff. So let's see what you have here. This this came out on Free RPG Day a few months ago and is now available on Drive Through RPG. And people have been very, very happy with it. It's got a few typos, which is annoying, but you know, it's, what we can do is, is do stuff better next time, which we are doing with uh, with Mage 20, which is currently just finishing up second stage development. Uh, Bill Bridges has gotten his uh, his evaluations and comments back to me with it, and he seems to be very, very pleased. So that's Onyx Path knows where it goes from there. Uh, in the meantime, I'm wor working on. The Book of Secrets, Gods, Monsters, and Familiar Strangers, uh, and How Do You Do That? A Practical Guide to Sphere Magic. Uh, all three of those are currently in progress, and I've also got things coming together for Truth Until Paradox 2 or 3. There were actually two editions of Truth Until Paradox done back in the 90s. No, uh, but the Truth Until Paradox... Uh, <coughs> Anthology is in progress. We've got several other projects on the boards as well. 
So with so, this anthology, yeah. this is going to be uh, like a, you're going to have a bunch of a bunch of more short stories about mage now now that we're in this modern uh, time. Yeah, that uh, was one of, one of the big things I said. I want Mage Twenty and the Mage Twenty line to be a game of now. You know, there there's definitely plenty of room for nostalgia, and one of the things that that we made a point of doing in terms of the design was to make it so that rather than us telling you, you will now play this game, presenting a huge, I mean literally huge number of options, and then giving people the opportunity of, do you want to run with the Avatar Store Metaplot or do you not? Do you want to run with the the, uh, the Ascension Warrior Metaplot or do you not? You, you've got the option either way. Do you want this to be a 90s mage, a 2000s mage, a 2000, you know, 20, 2015, 20, whatever mage? Go for it. Uh, one of the things that people have been very, very happy about, which makes me happy, is that the technocracy is not presented as the big, bad, evil, scary, soulless monolith that it originally was. Technocrat characters are as viable and as sympathetic as any other. Uh, there are options presented in there for evil traditions, you know, that the, the, that the traditions are corrupt. Um, there's also a number of surprises which I'm not going to spoil here. But suffice to say, one of the things that Bill said in his comments was, he, had, he, he says, I have my doubts. I had my doubts about the size and scope of what you were trying to do, but you succeeded. It's astonishingly good, his exact words. It's astonishingly good. That made me happy. And that's a lot better than being slightly good or barely good. You certainly want to be astonishing. Yeah. In department. And let me tell all you people out there at Barbarian Horror that I have... Looked at a tremendous amount of Mage Twenty. I was on the uh, uh, inside Brain, there. The Brain Trust, yeah. We've been fortunate to develop a little bit of a relationship, and uh, he's been kind enough to share some of these things with me. And it, it's really an impressive work. And having seen even in the uh, even in the beginning, pre-edited rough stages, I, I can say this about Phil. For those of you that I'm sure that follow, I will you tell he was one of the just in terms of writing uh, ability, one of the better writers they had, and his writing style has evolved and elevated and become uh, even better now. And I was very pleased and impressed with that. That's one of the first things I said to him. I said, wow, you've, as a writer myself, I looked at it and said, wow, you've, you're really uh, developing your style, which is, you know, an important thing for a writer to do. And it's not just his writing style, but his scope of being able to bring all this stuff in, all the different changes that different people and writers have brought in. you got to think about that, folks. There's an enormous amount of mage and other White Wolf books that have to be deemed canon or not canon. You look at them, and you're like, these four rules completely contradict each other. So uh, I'm sure that was just a nightmare. You're like, well, wait a minute. Uh, there's there's uh, rotes in the different mage books that are incorrect. You're like, Life 1, Prime yeah. 1, you can do that. And you look at them, and you read Life and Prime 1, and you go, no, you can't. You need Entropy yeah. 3 and Life 2 to do this. So uh, why don't you yeah. tell, tell a little bit about that, like some of the uh, reconstruction, reconstructional surgery that you had to do to make this a polished work instead of sort of a jumble that's all over the place from so many different voices, that so many, many voices without ears. So how did you, how did you handle that? Well, to, to give you an idea, to, to, give, to give you all an idea, I started writing Mage... Uh, and and I, I was not the only writer on it, but I was the primary writer. We also I, I brought in uh, Jackie Jackie um, Jackie Cassida and Nikki Ray are back for a couple of pieces of fiction. Uh, Alan Varney, Bill Bridges, uh, Jess Hennig, uh, and and um, why am I blanking on her name? I, this is terrible. Dino Dino McKinney. Uh, wrote several of the uh, the, the, the two-page spreads. Rochelle Udall wrote a number, a, a large number of the two-page spreads for uh, the disparate groups, and uh, Brian Campbell wrote a, a substantial section of the technocracy section, I, and, and the rest of oh, and and uh, John Sneed wrote a portion of, a, of Appendix One. I, I wrote the majority of the book, though. And I, when I started writing it, I was writing more or less in order. I began writing it in January of last year, and by June, by by July rather of last year, I had everything except chapters nine, ten, and appendix two finished. Chapters nine, ten, and appendix two took me from July of last year to March of this year. 
Why don't you tell the people what those chapters, just uh, real quick, about Those them. are the rules wow. chapters. Those are the what? <laughs> the character creation rule chapter was actually fairly easy. It's huge because I included all of the backgrounds and a number of the, uh, the secondary abilities. So it, it's very large, but that was, aside from rewriting some of the, the later backgrounds which were, which, in which the rules were problematic, uh, that section was pretty easy. Chapter 9 is setting rules, where I took basically, I consolidated combat rules, rules about drugs, rules about weapons, rules about destroying things, you know, uh, destroying material objects, uh, rules about the Umbra, rules about the digital web, rules about computers, hacking, vehicles, whole nine yards, to put them in. Some of the rules are revised, a handful of them are new. That section took three months. And then there was the magic rules chapter. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the magic rules chapter. That took from November to February. And the original draft of it, which I ended up cutting 40,000 words of before I even turned it, turned it around to the, to, uh, to the brain trust, was 140,000 words. To put that into perspective, that's longer than a player's guide. So obviously that couldn't fly. So I, I took that lar a large portion of that is going into the book, How Do You Do That? A Practical Guide to Sphere Magic. But I had a huge stack of books next to my, my computer for months and months and months. And as Ender and several of the other people uh, involved in the Brain Trust know, I was sending sections of revised rules going, does it work now? Does it work now? Does What about now? Does it work now? Is it fixed yet? <laughs> I absolutely do remember a good, good amount of all sorts of different things. Uh, looking over the different traditions. I remember him particularly being consulted about the Nefondi and uh, you know, a good <laughs> conversation we had there about Nefondi. And uh, mm -hmm. I had to say this about Phil. He's, he's very much like, okay, I got my idea, I got my vision, but you listen, like, which is a good thing to be. you got to have. You can't just go, like, oh, okay, and just waffle. And that's kind of the same way I am. you got to have that vision. And I was like, okay, we got to do this, we got to do this, got to do this. And, and, you know, he liked some of the ideas. He didn't like some of the ideas. But I, I found you – I found you – Perfectly easy to work with, and uh, yeah. I, I, I think that you you handle well uh, a helm position like that, and but at the same time using those other ideas because it's a very good strength to know what you know and, and what what you might have a strength or weakness on because there's so many different elements. I know you people out there that buy RPGs and never written one think it's it's all the same. Every it's just as easy to write one thing as another. But as you mentioned, yeah. writing magic. Is a nightmare. I have written a magic system myself for within the Ring of Fire, and mm -hmm. it is it is so uh, complex and complicated. You got to go. Did I cover this? Did I cover this? Was this covered over here? Was it done this way? And Mage being a s extremely fluid magic system that you mm -hmm. assemble piece by piece. Boy, I mean that's it's rough. Like we talked about the, the spheres, people not not even really knowing. And this game master, well, I could use life two prime three and entropy four to do this. Before, why won't you let me do it? Oh, and, this, and then you got paradox. Uh, monkeying in there, so it it tells a great tapestry of your vehicles and implements to, to really tell wonderful stories there. But um, I think uh, it, it would be very interesting to may, 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 maybe I mean, do you have any examples there of of perhaps a rote you you saw earlier on in the game? You're like, oh, I gotta fix this. We gotta readdress this. Any particular examples that come from the oh, earlier? Oh God, yes. The uh, and I'm I'm not gonna name the person responsible for this one, and it actually isn't Jess Hennig, but but the the Prime Two lightsaber, like no, dude, where did you where did you come up with that? That's no, yeah, no, nowhere in the nowhere in the prior rules did it say anything about that. The other one, which gave me headaches, and actually ended up having to to cut the majority of it and put it into the Book of Secrets, was Resonance. Mm -hmm. Resonance was a fucking nightmare because oh, I, I had always stayed away from making it a rule from from from, from doing rules around it because I felt like Mage already had enough rules. When I did Sorcerer's Crusade, I did a resonance system for that, but it was based very heavily in the metaphysics of medieval Europe. It would not translate to, to you know, 20, 20th, 21st century technological world. It was very heavily based on religious and spiritual beliefs. So, obviously, the old resonance system wouldn't work. 
over the course of the major revised era, there were no less than five, and depending on how you interpret them, as, as many as seven different systems for resonance presented in different books. Two of them in the same book. And untangling that spaghetti and, and making, it, making it work with the original idea of resonance, which got lost very early on uh, in, in the revised era, that took some doing, and unfortunately, it wound up being so long that I ended up, it was, it was optional anyway, but I ended up cutting it and putting it into the Book of Secrets because that section is over 8,000 words long. As I mentioned earlier, we could not physically publish a 600,000 word book, yeah, and true. the idea of doing it as two, as two volumes for the, for the hardcover deluxe edition was not an option. No. So... Things like things like resonance, things like the how do you do that section, uh, wound up, th which they were optional rules anyway, were were cut and put aside, and will be presented in you know in the book of secrets. But the there were several, shall we say, creative extrapolations on what the spheres could do presented in the revised era, and very nice. I I, I understand. I understood that on one, but there was, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I don't, it's, a lot of stuff is ancient history. I'm not going to go there. I do not want to go on a revised bashing trip. Suffice to say that be, in between Mage 1st edition and 2nd and, uh, and edition, I had decided I would write all the rules. Uh, in, in some of the very early Mage books, uh, up till about the Book of Shadows, I had diff I had other people writing rules and writing rotes and things like that. Around the Book of Shadows, I realized I should be writing all of them because that was the only way I was going to know they were all consistent. So more or less between the Book of Shadows and um, the the Guide to the Technocracy, all the rules stuff, for better and worse, I wrote. After that, there were a bunch of different people writing rules, and it showed. And it so show. I said, I'm taking it all back. And I am going to be the only one writing mage rules. And uh, I think that's very there, good. There were there were other people throughout the the later mage the, the later mage books that I was working on. People would suggest the roads, but I was the one who would write the systems sure. because they they had to be internally consistent. There's still a lot of flexibility. There's still a lot of times where you could go uh, just just uh, on the mage twenty forum right now. The mage twenty uh, uh, the closed. Uh, group for for people who were backers, there was a discussion about the different about the Avatar: The Last Airbender and how the this how those would be reflected in the spheres, <clears throat> and about you know how elemental magic would be reflected. And somebody was like, "Well, wouldn't that just be forces or forces and prime?" I said, "Well, the way that in Avatar: The Last Ender, Airbender, the way that they presented it, their paradigm had to involve spirit, because part of what they were doing." Was tapping into the element. It was tapping into the spirit of the element, channeling it through their own spiritual development, which allowed them to manipulate the elements. Which brings me to probably the biggest, the biggest single change that I made in terms of the rules of Mage Twenty was, which was to take focus, which had been this this kind of nebulous term that had been applied to a tool that you used to cast magic or that you fooled people into thinking it was not magic. Uh, and turned it into the comprehensive way that you see your magic. Focus in in Mage Twenty is the the, the 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 combination of paradigm or belief, practice what you do to to focus that paradigm that belief, and tools the tools that you or instruments rather the the tools that you use in the process of of uh, of, of bringing your belief and your will and your intention and your practice into action. You combine them together and that's your focus. That allows for almost anything that a person can say, hey, my character believes this, therefore they do magic like this, and because they do magic like this, they use these instruments as part of their magic. And a almost, <clears throat> almost half of Chapter 10... In uh, which is the magic rules chapter in Mage 20 is a big section on beliefs and they're presenting an array of paradigms, practices presenting an array of magical practices 
with the associated paradigms and the associated instruments, and then a huge section of instruments, how they're used, who uses them, what they look like when they're being used, that sort of thing, and how they are connected with the other two. So rather than saying, I have a son of ether who uses matter through, I focus my matter through a transformation machine, you say, my character, Believes that science, uh, that all things that, that all things can be dis can be defined through technology, and that techno and that technology is wonderful. Uh, through that, he uses weird or he uses the practice of weird science combined with the uh, combined with the practice of gutter magic. Uh, what he does in the course of, uh, in the course of doing this is he builds strange machines out of found objects that are following his metaphysical principles. He uses weapons, he uses armor, he uses engines, he uses um, you know, a workshop and so forth to build these things which, through which he focuses his magic. It sounds complicated, but it's actually very easy. And when, when, the, when the folks in the Brain Trust had looked at this and when people have seen it you know, played out in the, uh, in the quick start, they're like, Oh my God! Now I know how my mage does magic, and you are not restricted in terms of. Excuse me, uh, you are not restricted in in Mage Twenty as to what kind of magic or what kind of practice you can do. I will be right with you. This is my my partner calling. Um, there. Okay, but. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we took something that had been a we took something that had been a problem through Mage Twenty for or th rather through uh, through Mage throughout throughout Mage, and I, I believe we fixed it. <laughs> and people people think that it that it has worked. And you know, if if folks don't want to use it that way, they can always go back to doing it the old way. But that's this this way works. Anyway. So I've been talking a whole lot. What would you like to know? <laughs> well, I got a, I got a bunch of questions, and, I, and as you people out there on YouTube land, I realize your main man has been sort of, sort of checking on here, and a bunch of you have been lighting me up on Facebook uh, with uh, a stream <laughs> of questions. Is out, the switchboard is out, is live, yes. So let me just hit a couple of these questions. Uh, okay. So that, uh, and I, won't, I won't use anyone's name here, because some people like that, some people don't. But uh, let's just, let me just have a scroll through, find, find a good one here. All right, well, let, let's start with this. Um, can you talk about any sort of changes in Mage 20, any different ways, any current perspectives you have on awakenings, on how you've sort of, uh, what, what we might expect new or, or a better flesh out like you just described there about, about the focuses, uh, how any additional fleshing out on awakenings, which I can tell you this, awakenings are probably the single most uh, asked about question that I get, and I plan on running some here eventually. Uh, to sort of get that over and explain, to really show people exactly how one might work, but that people seem to have a lot of kind of issues and concerns about that because it's such a quintessentially important part of the game. Yeah. I mean, that could change your concept from here to radically over here. Exactly. Uh, so sort of dynamic. So, could you sort of uh, give us your approach or your thoughts on from age twenty for a sure. weekend? Well, chapter chapter one takes the uh, takes the, the uh, chapter one of Mage twenty takes the greater arcana of the tarot and lays out the mage's path in terms mm -hmm. of the cards. Showing how the awake there's there's awareness there's the awakening there's temptation there's you know, there's there's rivalry all of these things and how all of these things play into the life. Oh crap! We uh, we dropped there. Let's oh no no no, no no I'm I'm still here. No, you're still here. Okay, we're still good. All right. But yeah, chapter chapter one. This is this is something. This is something. That that, uh, that that I did in terms of the way that the book is laid out, the first three or the first four chapters rather have no rules whatsoever. They they all they present different aspects of the setting. Chapter one follows the, the mage's path. Chapter two follows the, uh, the, the 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 concepts and the metaphysics of magic. Chapter three addresses the world of darkness as most people know it. Chapter four goes into the other worlds and starts you know at, at the penumbra and works outward. From there, and that way it lays out all of the uh, that way it lays out all of the concepts without tangling the concepts up into rules. Chapter ten and chapter uh, chapter nine and chapter ten 
take all the rules and say, so that thing that you read about in chapter two, you hear the rules for it, bang. So we disentangled a lot of the the, uh, the, the rules and the concepts from one another, so that they they reading about the so, so that in reading about them, they're not uh, they're not it, it's not confusing. You know, to tell where one ends and the other begins. In terms of my view of awakening, uh, mage, is a, mage is a metaphor. Mage is a metaphor for waking up in real life, for opening your eyes to possibilities and opening your uh, opening your mind to to greater uh, uh, to greater potential. And going, wow, you know what? The world doesn't have to be like this. I don't have to be this person that I am told that I am. I am not restricted in this little role that society and the media and my parents and school and all of this have set for me. Fuck that, I can break it. I can be the person that I want to be. Mage is about, fundamentally, about remaking your reality. Doesn't really matter which faction you belong to, doesn't really matter which rules you employ, doesn't matter how you identify yourself. Mage, and particularly Mage 20, is based on the idea of make your own fucking world. Be your own fucking hero. Because that's to me, especially these days, that is a, an absolutely essential thought for people to have. Uh, one of the things, and, and we, we, we talked about it back in the 90s, but it's become so incredibly prevalent in the 21st century, is that we are being sold identities, that we are being sold a reality, our, our entire our, our political views, our social views, our views of other people are being sold to us as product, and we're being told that we need to take this, this, this reality off the shelf and accept it because it's the one we've got. And to unto that, I say bullshit. And that's what Mage, if you really want to get into what Mage and the Awakening is all about, it's about taking that reality which is handed to you and saying, bullshit, fuck you, I make my own. Yeah, And that's I, not easy. Huh? I, have to, I can definitely say that about Mage knowing like the, a lot of the real back history story, which we won't go into too much here, but I know there's a lot of actual political undertones, and, it, and the game itself oh, yeah. really, if broken down, is a very cleverly done, um, difficult to, to 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 notice on a surface level. But if you start breaking down beyond that, it's 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 a satire, really. Uh, from oh God, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, jo Jonathan Swift esque of breaking down and bringing out the, the this political social satire and uh, this commentary that, that's so largely a deeply entrenched part of Mage. Which uh, is really interesting, and and it can kind of get you if you really think in it. And we're not saying go out and practice magic. We're not saying that. Mm -hmm. We're saying um, if you think yeah. about it, just just the concept behind that challenge, what you're being told. I think that's really the whole exactly. idea. Of the awakening. It's like when you no longer have the blinders on, and you're saying that uh, you need to think for yourself. And I think that's really where you're. Yes. Um, yeah. That and that's that's that is it's it's an essential element of the world of darkness as a whole. Uh, the the element of socio political parody, satire and and subversion has been a part of an essential part of the world of darkness since you know since Mark and and Stuart and 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 Andrew and Travis and all made the original vampire and especially from the point where where Andrew Greenberg did uh, uh, Chicago by Night that the, the the element of satire and the element of politics becomes very very obvious. Andrew, Bill, and I, and as well as Jennifer and Ian and, and Rich and the others, we we were trying and apparently succeeding in hindsight. But we were trying to get people to to question question what a role playing game could be, and, and obviously Mark and Stuart as well. Question what a role playing game could be. Question what your life was. Question the assumptions of your life, both at and away from the table. World of Darkness has always been about that, and Mage, I think, more than most. Because while Vampire had you going, you know, I, I must, a beast I am, yes, less the beast I become. And Werewolf had, you know, rage against, the, rage against the worm. Mage was always about wake the fuck up and change your world. And I, that, that, that message, that idea has only become more powerful to me over time. So it's even more a part of Mage 20. Well, and I think that's really a great thing to say, like the... Uh... The, the social roots and and world of darkness just in general, vampire, werewolf, mage, particularly, were so counter culture in the early to mid '90s. You know, it was it was cool. It was as cool as role playing games have ever been. You know, you'd see the guy in the vampire shirt with the brujar, the Tory door on it, 
walking around in the mall uh, or, or, or what have you at the, at the, yeah. at the concert. And it, it was different. It wasn't, it wasn't Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't riffs. It wasn't Star Wars. It was a whole different deal. And it's because of that you tapped into something real and you really generated a fan base on that. You challenged role playing. You made it say, look, yeah. it's not about rolling dice. Fuck the dice. Get out there and run around in the mine. Use these techniques. And a lot of uh, yeah. talented uh, role players, a lot of advanced role playing going on. Uh, I've gotten to know Mark Ryan Hagen fairly well, and I can see yeah. sort of that idea, and I've gotten to know you a little bit, and I can see you know a lot of the ideas and the concepts you have of what role playing can and should be. And mm -hmm. to me, that's where you know that's where the money was. It wasn't the mage, it wasn't the, uh, that. It was you know the, the social idea that you're bringing combined with a high idea of role playing. And here, what what what, what do we you know you guys could have been talking about role playing Ewoks and indoor, you know, it was the fact that yeah. it was about role playing, about immersion, about getting in a character, about making making it uh, uh, amazing. And it, it elevated the level of, it generally elevated the entire level of the role-playing hobby, uh, those and games. Well, which, some people think we elevated. There are still people who hate our guts for it. <laughs> there are still people who think we ruined the hobby. But, you know, well, fuck those guys. It really, uh, I'll say it. You don't have to say it. Fuck those guys. You suck. How about that? <laughs> you don't have to say it. Yeah, you don't have to be nice. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they're, 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 they're yeah. more fools. You know, you guys did a, did a hell of a deal, a hell of a, a contribution to the hobby as, as a whole. So, Thank you. You know, I mean, yeah, we had we had people. I think I talked about this last time, but we had there were several distributors who were trying to ban us. You know, it was uh, we, there were people trying there there were people and organizations trying to have us shut out of, of role playing because we were ruining it. And there's still some people today who think that we who think we did. Oh well. Well. I mean, look, not everybody in life can be right. You just got to remember that. And you got to keep on pushing on and keep it going. And for those of you who haven't tried Mage, if you haven't tried Vampire, if you haven't tried, uh, I, at first, if you're reading those two games I'm going to pitch, I try, I pitch Wraith too. Um, yep. Those are the ones that I like. Those are the three in their line that I really like. Uh, and I would definitely strongly suggest that you pick those up, that you get involved with uh, World of Darkness. It's being brought back. It's not old. It's not classic. It's irrelevant. It's now. Like Phil said, it is. It is. It's not a victory lap. This Mage Clone is not a victory lap. It's nope. it's a victory lap right beside another victory lap that's pushed up against it. Maybe that's called an infinity symbol because you know it, it just keeps <laughs> getting, getting better and it, it's really uh, um, a, a, a retooled and and reorganized. And like he says, when you got one guy at the helm. Uh, it, their vision is going to come across. It's not going to be this to this to this to this to this. It's like you know, it's like all Legos. It's not like Legos, a Duplo, and, 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 and it connects and, 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 and uh, Mega Blocks. It's all one deal. Lincoln Logs, and if somehow you try to connect to that, maybe you're not going to do it. Um, so let's kind of get a little bit of more than nuts and bolts of uh, just just to hit a few of the questions yeah. that the, the fans are coming in here for you. You got a bunch of fans here, uh, Phil, asking me all sorts of questions. Thank so you, everybody. Initiates. Now, before I get back in. Uh, in the 90s, you had like the Masters books, which I, to me, I always found those completely useless. Like, mm -hmm. why, 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 why do I need to know stats for somebody absurdly powerful? He's just absurdly powerful, you know. Boom, done. Yeah. Uh, but someone who's at that beginning point, you're before the normal characters. To me, I found that uh, so interesting. It's like, hey, look, I have yeah. one dot of magic. I have two, maybe three, but they're all like in one. I got like prime one, spirit one, entropy one. So are there any sort of rules for uh, in the Mage 20 book or any of the books you're going to write the line to a deal and address initiates? Uh, there is not a huge section about being initiate. One of the things that we did do was, mm -hmm. was expand on the possibilities of what characters could do. Sure. Uh, there's still not, you know, if you're an initiate, you're still not going to be fling, flinging fireballs unless you've got a wild, uncontrolled talent, in which case you're you're more dangerous than than, than you are powerful. Well, hold on, let me stop you. Uh, right. Wild, uncontrolled talent. That that sounds new. Can you tell us what that is? Uh, actually, it it is in uh, it it. I'm forgetting off the top of my head just because so many books, but sure. it, it was addressed. It was addressed in some of the earlier mage books. I think it was addressed in mage uh, mage. Second edition. I know it was ad addressed in Sorcerer's Crusade, but the idea that in Awakening you get that whole blah moment where the yeah, in Awakening, <laughs> but you're not yeah, talking you're, about Path Awakening. I, I mean, I clearly remember. No, well, no, no, you, you can, you can. It's something, and I, I built on it. It, it once again, it, this, this was presented in Mage uh, in Mage Second, but, uh, but I built on it in Twenty. The idea that. Or the the idea of, of manifesting wild talents later in in your uh, uh, later in life and possibly having the the 
the death blow, you know, the the final, uh, the 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 last herald mage moment where you summon up everything you've got and then summon destroy yourself with some catastrophic uh, final act of magic. That that's in the, that that's an explicit part of twenty now. Yeah, I really and actually, that. in terms of the, the marauders, in which the marauders and then the Fendi the get. That was one of my questions on my list. Let's let's get to them right now. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was on the questions on my list. Uh, we wanted people okay. wanted to see how they've been changed from uh, from from the revised edition. The revised, uh, I was not a fan of Marauders. I used to like them. I thought they were like Pokemon Masters. Sort of. There uh, are no so fucking Marauder comic book heroes. God, I hated that. Yeah. God, I hated that. That's I I'm I generally avoid throwing brickbats at at stuff in the revised book, but the but the the, the Marauder superhero that just fucking pissed me off. Um. Marauders are not funny. Marauders are not cute. Marauders are not silly. And besides the 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 kid growing up th or the the guy thinking that that he's living in a comic book world didn't fit a book coming out in two thousand two anyway. Uh, there the Marauders Marauders and the Fendi are expanded significantly expanded in uh, in Mage twenty and they're scary as fuck. As well as the way it's supposed to be. Insanity isn't cute. Insanity is terrifying. Insanity is terrifying for the people around it. It's terrifying for the people who are insane. As for the Nefandi, they're more the Good infernal is in the path of screams type of Nefandi than the the boogie boogie Cthulhu you know Cthulhu worshippers who got shunted out beyond the veil because Avatar Storm. Yeah, right. And right. in 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 twenty in particular. Uh, in in twenty in particular, they're far more insidious. Yes, there there are the people going boogie boogie, you know, fear fear my tentacled lord. Those that's the cannon fodder. The actual ones, the string pullers, those are your Dick Cheney's. I think we talked about this last time. <laughs> I didn't know Dick, Dick Cheney. Is, oh is Dick Cheney not acting like a marauder right this fucking second? Oh, I mean, let me interrupt you for just one second. Let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, when I'm talking to Phil, we were talk, I, I think it was about an hour and a half we talked strictly on the phone one day about, about Nefondi, just straight Nefondi hour and a half. And uh, yeah. that, that, that's really when it came. I was like, Nefondi or Nick Cheney? And I was going to push you to see if we get you to come out, and you just offered it right up there for the silver platter. So, yeah, there, there you yeah. go. So that, that's kind of what is in his mindset, the uh, the old Impro Palpatine uh, versus instead of, say, say the Anton LaVey. Um, but, yeah, yeah please, please continue on. I just, uh, that was very entertaining. Well, just look at look at what he's doing right now, and not to go off on on politics too much, but look right now, this week he's talking about how President Obama is is defaming the patriotism of of our veterans by admitting that we tortured people. He's not saying, "Wow, we committed war crimes; that was bad." He's going, "It's defaming my patriotism and the and the patriotism of our fighting men and women to admit that we did war crimes." Seriously? Seriously? Yeah. So that's you, you. You want your nefendi? There, there they are. They're the ones getting getting you to think. Hey, waterboarding isn't torture. Hurting people isn't bad. You know, um, rape is only rape if it looks like I define it. And by the way, I'm going to stand at the border and scream at people and call myself a Christian while I threaten the lives of children. That's what your nefandi are doing. They're they're not they're, they're not running around you know sprouting tentacles and so forth. They're pulling you. They're 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 pulling out the darkness in you and going. There's nothing wrong with that, really. And especially if you're a mage, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, sacrificing people. No, that's that's a legitimate practice. We we do this all the time. It's okay. Don't be a pussy. Don't be politically correct about it. Don't you want the real power? Exactly. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you want to have that seduction. You want to have uh, really uh, a dark that is this is very entertaining, very 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 interesting. I think there's there's so many uh, potential possibilities with. with uh, a, few, a few years ago, I was involved with a sociopath, and I didn't realize she was a sociopath because I was in love with her, and I well, I'm not in love <laughs> with her. I did love. I did love her. Um, and I found her, she was very, very attractive, she was very, very seductive, she knew how to manipulate me and manipulate lots of other people, and I am not easily manipulated. Yeah. Uh, Wait, is this your story or mine? Wait, which one it, are we talking about here? Yeah, really. 
<laughs> really? Exactly. Really? Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not. I'm not outing. I'm, I'm not outing your your uh, your confidentiality. Oh no 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 no! I just meant. I just meant. I I understand. Yeah, and having been involved with that person, and it wasn't. The seams began to show at one point when she started when she had a psychotic breakdown, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know. So at, finally, I pulled. There, there were a number of people she was trying to play, play off of, uh, play against each other, and I told everybody, let's pull, let's pull our, our messages from this person. Let's pull our, um, let's pull the, the, the conversations and, and the, the email and looked at it and said, wow, she's either insane, evil, or both. Either way, she's toxic, she's bad news, she's way the fuck over there. And being involved with that person was an eye opener for me because I thought I couldn't be played like that, and I was. And that was a major influence. That was a major influence on how I present in the Fandy in Mage Twenty. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't think I could be played that easily, but I was. That's what they're doing. You know, and and of course you've still got your boogie boogie snake cultists for the people who want that. Uh, they're, they're, it's not, I'm not saying they're not there. I'm just saying they're not where you think they are. And in terms of the, the Marauders, like we were, like what led us into this, the Marauders are essentially you know, magical schizophrenic, metaphysical schizophrenics. That's been true ever since you know uh, uh, Kathy Ryan and I were brainstorming them up back you know in, when we were Kathy Ryan, Brian Campbell, and I were living together during the old Mage days or some of the old Mage days, and we would be having conversations about things like the Marauders and the Technocracy at three, four, five o'clock in the morning in our fucking living room. Uh, so that that's not a new concept, but that idea of the the wild talent, uh, I've expanded that into the Marauders to the point where that that's what they are is is a perpetual state of wild, un not. Uncontrolled but uncontrollable talent. They're they're like vortices. They're like metaphysical vortices of insanity, and yet they're still recognizably human. Most of them, and that to me is that's a scary thing. So yeah. anyway, back to questions because I could keep going on that all day. <laughs> uh, absolutely, no, I totally agree with you. Uh, and I've <laughs> it's been documented many many times, many videos, and you can check out my video on Marauders. You can check out my video on the Fondy if you want any more play points and tips on those. Uh, tons of videos on Mage Ascension. Also, check out the two-part video that I did uh, a little over a year ago with Phil, where we went through everything. This that was his history. That yeah. that was up to that point, and we're, we're kind of catching up with a, a, a part three here. You understand, maybe? But I've lived around people who are paranoid schizophrenics. Uh, they're not cute. They're not funny. They're horrifying. Yes. Because they are essentially uh, that guy that might be your buddy right now, and everything's cool, and then. That one wrong thing goes, and he thinks that you need to be killed, or that you're against him to the point where he starts, you know, his mind is, and you can't dislodge him of that uh, sort of idea. Uh, insanity is not cute, it's not funny, and that, it, quite frankly, is an appallingly uh, uh, disgusting view to take on that for the people that, oh, I'm a cute, funny little uh, Malkavian, and in a, and a Fondi, or excuse me, a Marauder, way worse, because you have the power of magic to produce out and project on other people. It's a horrible state of sickness, and when you get in that, that's how you weave the sympathy on the character. You show, look how damaged they are, but maybe still they're trying somehow at some point. But also, mm -hmm. whoo, boy, they're dangerous because the ro one wrong move yeah. and uh, and all that potency can certainly come out. Um, so yeah, let's uh talk about how uh, uh, any any hints. So you you mentioned a few hints of some of the books that are going to be coming out. But are we going to be seeing, uh, you know, a new version of the uh, tradition books, or uh, any any way that you're incorporating that and doing something new? No, no tradition books. We we are not we are not doing we are not doing new edition splat books. Uh, splat books. One, you 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 literally you'd spend years doing them, and the splat books, the uh, by by splat book I mean the tradition book, kit book, clan book, whatever. Yeah. Again, you would take years doing putting putting out all of them. Uh, then you know you turn around and put put out more than they they are they are resource intensive, they're time intensive. Uh, if you're playing a if you're playing a virtual adept, then it takes three years for the virtual adept book to come out. You're sitting around going, how do I play my character? Uh, but more to the point, and I mentioned I've mentioned this earlier, but it's but it's worth reemphasizing. Onyx Path Productions is not a brick-and-mortar 
company where there's a staff sitting around churning books out. We're contractors working in, in working in virtual offices with crowdfunded uh, with with crowdfunded books, and so to to do what we're doing, we're putting together large books generally, large books that contain a whole lot of information which we can put out there, and lots of players can lots of players can enjoy them. But the, that are getting that are they are they are resource efficient. That's that's, that's probably the way that I that, that that's the best way to put it. Splat books are not resource efficient. They're extremely resource inefficient. Putting together a two hundred thousand word book on the traditions is a, is much more resource is much more resource efficient than putting out than putting out nine or ten small books. One about each, about you know one of one of each tradition. That's what we're doing. All of the upcoming mage books are bloody huge. They're huge. Uh, I think the smallest one, other than the Quick Start, hell, the Quick Start was thirty thousand words. That was bigger than a uh, bigger than a Splat book. Yeah. And the, the Splat books again, talking about resource inefficient. The uh, the original Splat books, the first edition Clan Kith whatever books, were between fifteen and twenty four thousand words. Hell, that's nothing. There, yeah, there right. are reasons why you know the, the 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 revised ones. People like the revised ones better. That's because they're fifty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand words as opposed to fifteen or twenty. You yeah. can put a lot more material in there. So back then, when you had so uh, so little real source material to actually have to look and, and to produce those, I mean, you could probably knock a flat book out as a writer, as a serious writer, you could probably knock that in a week. You know, uh, a bit more than that. I, I wrote the Cult of Ecstasy book in two and a half weeks. Yeah, two and a half weeks. I mean, that's. I'm, I'm also a research. Huh? I said that's a pretty short period of time to write a book. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and as as is evidenced by the library here. That is substantial, folks. That's everywhere. I'm I'm a resource, uh, rather research. i I am a res research monster. My God, look at that! Uh, it is, that is especially now. Uh, it, this may or may not be a question that comes up later, but this has been something that's been discussed online a lot, especially now that we have social media, search engines, wikis, you know, that you can look up magazine articles from 20 years ago, that sort of thing. Especially with the the powerful research tools that we have on the internet, I am very, I am committed to making sure that the facts are as Facts and cultures are as authentic as I can possibly make them, because back in the day when we didn't have res when when the only resources that we had were you know hey I've got this book on this thing, yeah. uh, there was a there was a lot of culture fail, language fail, uh, history fail, and especially when you're trying to write a book in two weeks or three weeks or whatever, and somebody's getting paid two or three cents a word to write it. And you know you're you're dealing with with you're dealing with people who are you know 20 25 years old, and you don't have the ability to 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 log onto Facebook and ask somebody in Taiwan what what a what a regional expression would be, or is the Chinese you know, is, is my Chinese is my Cantonese right when I you know, when I phrase it this way? We made a lot of mistakes. Sure. Personally, I I am I am committed to making as few stupid errors as possible. It's not to say I won't make any, that's inevitable, but I'm committed to making as few stupid errors as possible. So once again, going back to, resource, be, to, to be, things being resource efficient, I want to make sure that the books that come out for Mage are as good as I can make them and are as informative as I can make them and the information is as accurate as I can make it outside of deliberate um, artistic, uh, outside of deliberate artistic uh, license, which I will usually point out and go, hi, this isn't actually historically true, but it is in the world of darkness. Um, so going back to the clan book or the, the tradition book question, no. We do have plans, plans, it is not on the schedule, we do have plans, crowdfunding and, and everything, you know, uh, uh, supporting supporting those plans. To do books about the disparates, the the the, uh, the traditions we've already mentioned, uh, technocracy reloaded. Those are those are planned, but but in terms of the grinding out ten little books a year, no, not happening. Uh, one of the many reasons I've talked about this before, 
one of the many reasons that I left White Wolf and that many people left White Wolf was because the pace of putting out 8 or 10 or 12 books a year per line was killing us. It was literally driving me crazy. And so I'm not doing it again. Well, yeah, no. uh, there, will, there are plenty of books in the works, but not a, not a flood of little ones. It will be a handful of big ones. Now, what about the distribution for these books? Are we going to be seeing Onyx Path getting into major distributors, like being in a, a Barnes and Noble? I doubt it. I doubt it. Oh God, no! That's one of, that 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 almost wrecked the gaming industry. <laughs> the reason that TSR was bought by Hasbro was because of because TSR got into uh, got into the big bookstores. Big bookstores return things. Big bookstores will order four thousand copies of a book and then return. 300 or, or yeah and then return 3500 of them to you next month and want credit for them no not happening um, I'm not a well there, there there were very few firm members of, of, of onyx path that's rich's company I'm a contractor sure. but I so questions about the future of onyx path are more for rich Thomas than they are for me but knowing what I know about them I don't ever see them them slash us getting a warehouse and hiring a warehouse staff and hiring an accountant staff and everything that you need the infrastructure to provide those things and this is something I, I had to, to mention this um, on the, the mage forums a couple of times so it's, it's worth mentioning here when when I joined White Wolf uh, in, in 1993 on staff I was the 17th employee there were five Four people working in the warehouse and four people working in, uh, in in accounting and accounts receivable. So half our company was spent just selling books, invoicing books, collecting the money for the books, and sending the books out and stocking the books. That's the kind of devotion to to manpower and resources that you have to have if you get into that that business. As far as I'm aware, Rich does not plan to do that, and I know I want no part of it. Mm -hmm. I'll continue to make the books, but that's all I'm doing. I ain't working in a warehouse again. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. They have a warehouse as if you're all sort of slave laboring away writing the books with, uh, with, with uh, uh, someone behind you just cracking the whip on your back. Uh, so. Yeah, no. No, I, I have... I've worked enough tables at conventions and worked enough warehouses and worked enough sales floors to last me a lifetime. <laughs> Sure. No, I can imagine the conventions uh, are really uh, a grind there. Uh, it I, is. I think that, that's actually interesting. Completely uh, non sequitur here, but you want know, to just tell us a little about sort of. I don't want to say like your first convention experience, but maybe something that you were just like, <laughs> either something that's really exhausting or something that was funny or maybe the stupidest question you've ever been asked at a convention or just a you know kind of moment. Um, I think it'd be kind of entertaining for the for the fans to hear. Okay, well, there, there was, I, I had a stalker who challenged my, my then fiancé to a duel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this was, she was, she was somebody I had, she was somebody I had met at a convention, and I, I thought, oh, okay, we're, we're neat, we're friends, we're talking. This person took it a little bit, took it a little bit further than that, followed me to another convention, Kept trying to kiss me, and I kept going. Uh, Hi, I'm I'm engaged. I'm with her. You know, thank you. It's good. Yeah, hug. No problem. And she finally she got drunk and challenged uh, my my then fiance to a duel. We left after that. Um, That's crazy. I, I I can't honestly remember the, the the stupidest question I've been asked because honestly, most of the people that I've met at conventions and so forth are are very far from stupid. Oh, well, I'm sure. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not one of those people who goes, oh, the fans, the fans. No, I love fans, and I don't just say that because I'm on, yeah, because I'm on YouTube now. No, I really enjoy meeting people. I love going to conventions. I love doing signings. I love hanging out and meeting people. And anybody who's met me at a convention knows that unless I am completely fucking exhausted, and sometimes even then, I will talk and talk and listen and hang out with people. Some people have taken that a little bit too far, but other people have become some of my best friends. I have literally met some of my best friends uh, at, at conventions or, you know, while on the convention trail. S.J. Tucker, uh, who is one of, one of my closest friends, a musician. If, if, you haven't, if you haven't heard her work, I highly recommend it. Uh, but Suge and I met time. when I was... Make sure the people catch that. Say her name one more time. S.J. Tucker. 
Suj, S-O-O-J Tucker or S-J Tucker. And how, how is her Highly health cool. going right now? Is she doing oh, okay? she's fine. She's Never fine. That was years ago. I interviewed that she was uh, not doing well. You wrote a, wrote a book for her. Yeah, no, that was that was a while ago. That was like yeah. five years ago. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, Suj, Suj is fine. Actually, she's working on a new album. She's here in Seattle. We were just hanging out with her yesterday, and we'll be seeing her later today. But um, but I met I met her. Just she came up to uh, came up to our our booth when when I was with Laughing Pan Productions when we when we released Deliria and we're on what I call the great the great con crawl of two thousand four. Uh, but we we met we hit it off uh, we took her with her to uh, we took her with us I should say to a couple of conventions and we've gotten to be great friends three years later she introduced me to my partner Sandy Buskirk and that was pretty fucking awesome <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, I love conventions huh that's a good friend there isn't it yeah I mean, you can't ask for much yeah. more than that can you yeah that's uh, talk talk about great stories we uh, I I pulled up with with my friends Ben and Rita. Uh, we pulled up at Fairy Worlds 2007, and it just just as uh, as Suge and, and her then partner Kay were getting out of the car, and they get they get mobbed by people, and and as I as as uh, as I'm saying hello to her, she goes, um, Sandy, i uh, Phil, I mean Phil, I mean Sater, I mean Phil, this is Sandy, I mean Damiana, I mean you guys should know each other, and it was we we hit it off instantly, and and we've been partners ever since, so right. that's kind of awesome. <laughs> Very uh, interesting, romantic, and friendly story there. Uh, yeah, just had our seventh anniversary last, uh, not last weekend, weekend before. Seven. Well, uh, certainly a, a, a mysterious and auspicious number there. So congratulations to you for that. Leave a comment in the box below. Congratulate the man, people. What's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> so, because uh, he can come back and look, he's gonna have a look. Say, oh, you didn't leave me a comment. Well, hell with you. <laughs> Forces fireball. Um, so. What is the uh, what is the price point looking like? Is going to be for Mage Twenty for the uh, for, for for the main book? What what sort of price point are we looking at? Uh, that's an Onyx Path question. I have no right. idea. I know it's I know it's going to be the the um, the big deluxe, you know, super hardcover full color monstrosities. They're already spoken for. I mean, that was you know backed by the Kickstarter months ago. I know the print on demand editions will exist. I think it's the the price point is going to depend on the page count. We don't currently know what the page count is going to be, other than it's going to be large. Well, at, at almost five thousand, at almost five hundred thousand words, yeah, that's going to be. I don't know what kind of font you're using, but uh, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I the, uh, um, Cheney, Mike, Mike Cheney, and I have been talking about the words per words per page count and. Um, if he can make the words per page count that we've been talking about, we'll be fine. It'll still be a very, very large book, but I, I really don't want to have to cut it again. <laughs> that, that is, cutting cutting it at this point, we, we'd be we'd be starting to lose blood and bone. It is um, so it's they're going to be very large books. How large that, exactly? I don't know yet. A very interesting question I want to talk to you about because I was right with him to bring a fire. Uh, that was the thing I had. Like I was like. Oh God! This is going to be five hundred thousand words, and I said that's way too much for a, a beginning first book from a, a yeah. an indie publisher. So I had to do loads of cutting and figuring. Let me take this and put it here, and because there's some things that automatically beg for other things to have to be included, or they're essentially worthless. Yeah. Then you get that, but then if X, Y, and Z isn't in a book, then I go, oh, well, where's that? So it, it really leaves you right. kind of a weird position when you're cutting. So what were your sort of guidelines? For where you were going to cut things, what? How, how did you? How did you uh, approach that? I think well, I think the biggest, that's for I don't know. Maybe no one else would care, but I, I find that really fascinating. Well, the biggest ones. The first thing I, I decided early on there there's a bit, there's very little flavor fiction, and the flavor fiction that's in there is brief. You know, some of the a sig a, a, a kind of a a, a uh, hey. trademark not, not a trademark but a a a, a, a Common element in a lot of the earlier mage books was tons and tons and tons of, of fiction, sure. with the material being worked into it. I didn't do that in Mage Twenty because there's just too much material to cover. Um, in terms of the stuff that I wound up cutting, because most of that wasn't even written, the stuff that I ended up cutting was: Do I absolutely positively will someone absolutely positively need this to play Mage as it is currently envisioned? Yes, it's in. No, it goes into Book of Shadows, a uh, Book of Secrets, rather, and that's why Resonance, um, 
there there are some practices and things that were cut, but that's that's why uh, resonance and how do you do that and I'm trying to think there there is enough there was there were some sections that I wrote for chapter chapter nine called mage tricks, which were things that you would do to like arrow catching or bullet catching or sensing, you know, sensing the landscape in the middle of a fight and things like that. And I ended up cutting those. They'll be put into uh, to Mage, uh, or rather into uh, to Book of Secrets because you don't need them to play the game. Um, the stuff about paradigms, the stuff about practices and instruments, the stuff about, you know, martial arts and things like that, you need those to play the game, so they're in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I cut most, but not all, of the optional rules. Uh, I did write a significant number of optional rules, but I left I, I, I left a number of them in because although they're optional, they're important. Uh, things like I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what they are because it's it's been a few months now since I finished it up. Uh, well, it's the section the, there's there's a, a fairly significant section in there about psychotropic drugs. If you're playing an ecstatic or or a progenitor or you know various types of very you know various types of, of people from other sects, psychotropics are very important. If you're playing you know a, a hermetic, well, hell, you could even have a hermetic who uses drugs. If you're playing a dream speaker, the way that ayahuasca functions in the game is very very important. So that even though it's technically optional rules was left in um, resonance. As I, as I said earlier in, in, in this discussion, I never wanted to have rules for resonance in the first place because I thought that it was something that you could, and I was right, spend a whole lot of words explaining and people would still have a hard time with it. And I feel that Mage has too many rules in the first place, so I, I didn't want to add more. Uh, the, the resonance rules are optional. The wonder rules, which got significantly and to me to to me personally head breakingly expanded during the revised era, um, the wonder rules, the expanded wonder rules are optional because they were they ran fifteen thousand words in in the the version of them that I did. Uh, you don't need fifteen thousand words worth of rules about magic items in order to use magic items. There's a two thousand word summation of them in, in Mage 20. There's a very expanded version of that in, in the Book of Secrets. Um, I left out most of the merits and flaws just because there are over a hundred of them. I wanted to have something where they will all be available. That's going to be Book of Secrets. But they didn't all need to be available in, in, the, in Mage 20. So, so there are only about... Yeah, there, there are roughly 25 of them. I haven't counted again in a while. I did... Inc I did I did, however, include derangements because, especially in Mage Twenty, which which goes into things like um, goes into things like fugue state, disassociation, reality breaking, again the Marauders, uh, that sort of thing. I felt the idea of I, I felt that presenting systems for insanity was important was important to the game, so that's actually still in there. Uh, I did. There were a number of things in the revised in the revised era and the revised edition that I really liked. The idea that there were different kinds of quiet that's been that's been kept and expanded upon. The different types of paradox backlashes, obviously, that's still there. Uh, things like that, and and I felt that it was important to the game to keep those in. Uh, in terms of flavor fiction that I had written to introduce various sections, all gone. Uh, the flavor fiction at this point opens the uh, opens the chapters, opens the book itself, and in chapter five, which is a hundred and five, I think, thousand word overview of of the various different factions, the awakened world. Each of the factions has has a bit of flavor fiction to give a uh, to 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 kind of give a portrait. But other than that, the fiction went. Question. Let me ask you this. You know, you said about a um, anthology uh, that you're going to be putting together now. Yes. Is, is, yeah, is that something that's in progress? Uh, crowdfunded, or is that something that's is it already written? Have you already? It's written? already paid. For. It's What's oh, that? it's already it's already paid for. It's in progress. It's not written it yet. Has, but. It hasn't been hasn't been fully written though. 
it has not it has not been fully written. Actually, I haven't even gotten most of the writers yet. Basically, what I'm doing with that book is I'm doing it like it's a regular anthology, not like a game anthology. Okay. I am. I sent out invitations to a bunch of writers and said, "Write me a story, and I'll pick the best ones." I did and hire a person to write the Nefandi story and a person to write the Order of Hermes story and a person to write the Virtual Adept story. I said in the, the, in the invitation, I said, I would rather have five great stories about marauders than nine mediocre stories, one for each tradition. Mm -hmm. So I don't honestly know what it's going to look like yet, but I'm committed to having it being an anthology of good stories, not a bunch of placeholders for you know, giving this group their cookie and that group their cookie. Sure. To me, Mage was Mage has never been about the groups. Mage has been about people, individuals, the the the, the factions, the you know whether it be the Order of Hermes or the Progenitors or whatever. These are these are groups of people. Um, they're they're not the fun, they're not the foundation of, of Mage. The foundation of Mage. Is the awakened human beings that, that that happen to be in those groups? That to me, and especially in Mage Twenty, is much more important than um, and the progenitors do this. Yeah, well, yeah. I definitely think with, with fiction, you want to, uh, and, and that was definitely a thing with the old White Wolf. It was very up or down with the fiction. Um, yeah, there were some 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 books that were, and other books that were. Oh, that was a really good book. I really enjoyed reading that. Um, so, I mean, I really like that, that, that you said that you're kind of going with what you find to be the best idea, what's going to be the most compelling, and just entertain people and kind of get the setting over, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is a really important thing. So, right now, I, I believe I believe you, you threw the word 10 out there. There's about 10 other books that you either have conceived or have yeah. begun to write. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's around that. I haven't, I haven't counted them for a while, but it's, 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 it's like 10. Yeah, we, we funded, and thank you, I want to say this. Thank you to everybody who supported the crowdfunding, whether it was through sponsorship, whether it was through spreading the word, whether it was from your enthusiasm, all of the above. Thank you very much, because we literally could not have done this without you. Uh, and because so many people were so enthusiastic, Mage is going to be a line. How long that line runs and how 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 many books are in that line is going that's going to depend on how enthusiastic people stay and how good we continue to, uh, how, how good the books that we continue to put out are. Uh, part of my commitment as, as long as I'm continuing to do this, part of my commitment is to making sure that every book is good. I would rather have put out three books or five books that are great than put out ten books of which you can throw away half of them. I mean, I mean and, and that's definitely great. You seem to have a lot of one of the main things I'm taking away, correct me if I'm wrong, but internal consistency is what you want. You're not yes. only trying to put out a quality product, but you're trying to put out a, a product that doesn't contradict itself because you kind of looked at it and you learned from the mistakes, which is always kind of mm -hmm. a kind of cool thing that always uh, I jive with me. White Wolf made yeah. a lot of mistakes, but it always seemed to learn from the mistakes. And okay, oh boy, this first edition book here, oh wow, that's broken. Okay, how do we fix that? How do we change? How do we keep pushing it, and of course, you know, always more mistakes are made along the way, but it seems to be an idea of not being afraid to fail, and when you're not afraid to fail, that's when you can really soar and create some, you create art, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're playing by the numbers, if you're playing too safe, you're not going to make art, you're not going to make anything beautiful, you're going to make something that's that's bog standard and, and just forgettable, mm -hmm. but yeah. it seems like you're going to have a lot of internal consistency at a game that people aren't like, wait a minute, just uh, 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 the dirty secret is a black hand. Well, what's this? I don't understand. Um, it seems yes. like you're not going to have that kind of hang-up and issue here. Yeah. Some of, some of that, particularly with Mage and Vampire, some of that was intentional. Uh, one of the things, Dan, uh, rather, Andrew, Andrew Greenberg uh, and I were committed to was constantly undercutting uh, was, was constantly undercutting expectations with the, the guide to the technocracy being you know the, 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 the key example you know where you're being told oh the evil technocracy oh the original oh the evil technocracy the technocracy is is this and this and this and then in the introduction of the technocracy like yeah are, aren't you glad you don't have a werewolf in your living room you're welcome aren't you glad you have electric lights you're welcome you know um, you're, you're not 
working as a serf in some crazy wizard's uh, fiefdom, you're welcome. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. No, we're the good guys. Seriously, we are. I, I love doing the... I love doing the, the, sub, the, the constant subversion of expectations. What I don't love is having a bunch of different rule systems to do, you know, to, with, con, with contradictory rule systems. Um, that's something that I'm, I'm committed to. As long as I'm doing this, committed to making sure the rule systems are not confusing, the rule systems aren't contradictory. As far as the material, I, I, I am also committed to continuing to, uh, to, to, have keep, to keep people guessing. Because that's part of what Mage is. Mage is not about there's a single answer and a single reality and everything is like blah. I no, love that. I love that. That's a wonderful answer. It's not. Thank you. you know, it's it's all over the place, you know. And, and just 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 when they think, just 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 when they think uh, they figured out the answer, that's when you change the question. Exactly. Well, and that's one of one of the many reasons that Mage Twenty is so damn big. Is because rather than saying yes, Avatar Storm, no, Avatar Storm, we said maybe Avatar Storm. What do you think? And because there were a lot of points in terms of meta plot and a lot of a lot of things in terms of setting that are up that, that we leave up in the air, we we filled out the options and left a lot of things left a lot of things up, left a lot of things open. That to me is and and we talked about this a little bit. In the last discussion, but it was also part of my my original discussions with uh, with Rich when we were hashing out the design. Was I said Mage has always been about dynamic reality. If Mage becomes cookie cutter, then that's completely contradicting the point of the the, the, the point of the series. So it should always be dynamic. It should always be changing and changeable. And ultimately, the the ultimate answer belongs to you, the reader and the gamer, not to us telling you what what it is. Have you thought about putting out a book that, because Mage, like you talked about the meta plot. Now, I've always looked at White Wolf as yeah, it has this meta plot, it has this real world deal. But you also have the possibility with with Vampire, with Mage, with Werewolf, you have all these statistics, all these ideas, all these these gifts, all these spheres uh, lined out and delineated for you. Uh, putting out a book where you say, okay, well, yeah, that's our our standard. But over here, you know, here's how you might adapt it to a science fiction world. Here's how you might adapt it to a fantasy world. Here's how you, how you might have that kind of bring over to, to sort of uh, sell it as a whole other genre uh, of, of play potential and possibility with the same core ideas that you've already constructed. Maybe, I don't know. We, it's something we've talked about over the years. And in the, uh, in the Book of Mirrors, there's, there's a chapter talking about you know, different, and and in the book, in the uh, in the Mage Storyteller's Guide, even more so, which the Book of Mirrors was the original Mage Storyteller's Guide. But in both of those books, there are a lot of options presented for how to run. If you were going to run a Stone Age game, if you were going to run a medieval game, and then of course there's Sorcerer's Crusade. I do have some alternate history stuff in mind, but it is not yet in progress, and it is not yet crowdfunded. So I'm not going to talk about that. Sure. All right, well, uh, I, I have a bunch of other things before we go. I don't know, we're starting to run a long time, but I have a bunch of things I want to get to, and I think you can yeah. thumb the mage up very well to the people out there. Go get your copies uh, of all the uh, <laughs> classic World of Darkness. I mean, I just call it World of Darkness because that's what I'm about. Yeah. And, you know, uh, support it. Get your T-shirts for mage. Get your, you know, uh, stay involved. Kickstart these other projects. If you've already kickstarted them, I'd like to thank you uh, for, for trying to keep great gaming alive and coming up. And I think it's very, uh, it's excellent that, that Onyx Path is doing it. It's like, it's like a real uh, treasure for all of us who thought, well, these great games are gone, and now we have Mage Awakening, and we have Vampire the Requiem, and, and whatever. And to have the actual, the genuine, the real article brought back and, and, and customized and, and made polished a little bit more with new storylines, with new ideas and visions and of course you know you can you can always you can look at all of them and say okay well yeah I like this part and this part and you cut and choose and make make yeah. it whatever is going to work best at your table but uh, mm -hmm. I think see what he's saying having that consistent engine here to, to tell a game that the number one hit I always get on mage is I, the magic was too complicated for me. It was too confusing. Why does this fear do that? And and, and having this whole book he's going to put together with, with ropes put together and sort of streamlining it, making it more digestible and easy for you to understand, I think is really going to help pop it. And I think Mage is definitely one. If you haven't looked at look at it. If you looked at it before, 
and it didn't quite resonate with you, give it another spin. Give it another try. Take, take another look at a streamlined idea. And I think it might jive. The, the, the concept and, and the, the the quality is definitely there. And I think if you can find it, I'll play it. I love Mage. Uh, I think that if, if you give it an honest an honest go around, uh, that you're going to go. And of course, I got the huge Mage fans out there. Like, of course, we know, we know, we, we love it. <laughs> and that's what he's talking about, making more of it for you. And make your voices vocal. You know, go bother him on Facebook. Say, we want this, we want this, we want this. And, uh, the, the, you know, and thank, and thank you, Rich Thomas. There. What's that? And thank you, Rich Thomas, because if it wasn't for Rich Thomas, none of this would be happening. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, honestly, thinking about that, I'm probably going to have to go reach out to Rich and get him on this show, because I think people would be very interested to hear that story as well. The, the, uh, the inner workings of a, a company... From a production side, uh, to me, it's fascinating. I don't know, but you guys out in the horde, I, I would, I, I think, definitely to reach out and see if he's interested in coming on. Um, but so, uh, is there anything else in in closing this part before we get on to, to part number two uh, mm -hmm. that you'd like to, to mention, my major that we haven't quite touched on yet that the, that might uh, be of interest to, to the, the people? Any other changes or, or anything special that you've uh, you've done there? Well, oddly enough, considering the size of it, I think Mage Twenty is more accessible. Uh, that was one of the one of the other design one of one of the other design um, parameters I had was I wanted to have this despite it being a large book it's a large book full of possibilities uh, there are a lot of things in there that are optional there are several sections in there where I flat out say at the beginning of a section or the beginning of a chapter if you want you can just toss this you can do X in in the uh, in the storytelling chapter uh, I, I write about how if you want to have a character if, if 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 you want to do a uh, a chronicle that has nothing to do with the traditions or technocracy or ascension war or anything. Here's how you can do that. Uh, I I want to emphasize both in in Mage 20 and in talking about Mage 20 that Mage Mage 20 and and Mage you know from from this point forward especially it's about people. It's not about having to know tons of back history. It's not about having to memorize complicated rules. I made a point of making it as accessible as possible while still having a lot of the, uh, the material that people want and need to have. And I think especially, especially now in the 21st century, it is, more, it is a more timely game than it was 20, now it's 21 years ago. Uh, the... 21 years back, you know, back 19, 1992, 1993, 1994, the internet barely exists. The idea that people want to just, you know, that, that, that people are just going to, you know, sit back and, and have their, their spoon-fed reality handed to them, that was a much more prevalent idea, especially since the turn of the millennium and most especially since 2000, 2001 pointed it out. We've begun to realize just how complex and how wonderful and how potentially terrifying our world and how big our world really is. I think Mage is more. I think I think Mage is more relevant now than it was 20 years ago, and I made a point of making Mage 20 more accessible than Mage was 20 years ago. So that, like I said earlier, be your own damn hero. It's about you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that, that's pretty cool. Mage definitely gave me good center around do a lot of interesting stuff. Um, let's talk about some of your other projects. Why don't we start with uh, if you're comfortable with this? Why don't we start with Power Chords? Why don't you tell Power me? Power Chords. Finally, almost <laughs> fucking four years after this funded, I, I was an early for for folks who don't know this story. I was an early adapter of of Kickstarter. I, I think Kickstarter existed had existed for maybe six months. When Aaron Acevedo and I started uh, brainstorming and, and pitched this this little thing that was originally supposed to be just a source book, an open source source book on music, magic, and urban fantasy, I figured it was going to be about fifty, maybe sixty thousand words. You know, eighty, hundred pages. Ace was going to do some art for it, and it was going to be neat. Then I started writing it, and it grew, and it grew. And it grew and it grew, and I've written a well over two hundred thousand words worth of material for it. But I realized I ended up having to cut it down to about it's about two it's about one thirty, um, because I didn't expect how well <laughs> Kickstarter was going to work, and I wound up getting funded 
officially funded for a thousand dollars more than, than I was asking for. Uh, however, I also realized that quick that, that Kickstarter costs more to use than you think it will. Uh, and that all the pledges that are made aren't necessarily going to come through. By the time the fees were processed and, 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 and the people who had pledged but the money wasn't actually there were sorted out, my, my $5,100 in pledges was more like $4,300 uh, that I actually had to work with. What are from that I had to pay? They are. Go ahead. I think that'd be an interesting question. I, I only have briefly looked at Kickstarter. What are the actual percentages they charge on Kickstarter? Once well, well, say you get five thousand dollars, what are they going to take out of that? Kickstarter, Kickstarter charges four point five. Amazon charges four point five for processing the transactions. That's the part they do mention it, but people look at the four point five and they go, "Oh, it's only four point five. No, it's nine. Nine. Right off. A lot of money. Right off the bat, that's huh? Uh, nine's a lot of money. Yeah, that's right. Right off the bat, that's ten percent. Assuming that every single transaction that is pledged goes through, which in my experience does not happen. Um, assuming that you funded for ten thousand dollars, one thousand of that, one thousand that right off the top goes to, goes between goes between Kickstarter and Amazon. Yeah, Kickstarters are taxable. That's another, depending on your state of, uh, could be anywhere from four to from four to eight percent. Um, and then there are the transactions that don't go through. Somebody says, "I'm going to pledge five hundred dollars," and then when it hits their bank account, five hundred dollars isn't there. So you're out five that five hundred dollars. Um, Though when they process when when Amazon processes a transaction and it doesn't go through, they charge you eight percent, not not. 4.5%. So you got charged 8% of the transaction and the transaction didn't go through. So you're actually out 500 and whatever 8% of the transaction. You more yeah. the transaction. Four, four, five. So you're actually out $504 at that point. So wow. very very quickly you you've got this great number that says I made five you know, I made I made $10,000 and you're actually seeing about after the after the the transaction fees, after the taxes, after the people who pledged but but didn't come through, you're actually looking at about seven thousand dollars. And then you've got to start making those, you've got to start providing those wonderful stretch goals and and things that people uh, that 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 they're great ideas, add-ons and stretch goals. It's a magnificent thing. It drives interest. It 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 inspires people to get really excited. But you still have to produce them. Yeah, and that costs money, and that costs time, and that that takes resources, and a lot of people don't budget for that. I know I certainly didn't because I had no idea. Um, as I said, power cords. I got for about r roughly forty three hundred for power cords, and I mean I didn't get forty three hundred. I got forty three hundred that get, that got divided between Sherry Baker, the uh, the layout, uh, the, the the graphic designer, between the three artists, um, Ace, Brian, and uh, and and Sandy, uh, with the editor Eli. I got about a thousand bucks, and that sounds like a lot of money until you figure that I wrote over two hundred thousand words worth of material. And that it's going to cost me over two thousand dollars to print and ship the damn things to the sponsors. So I'm going to be out of pocket on it, but I'm not crying about it because it's much better than I originally expected. It's much, it's it's bigger, it's better. It is far better than a, a far better book than it would have been three three years ago. Um, and I got a series out of it. I'm still going. We're still going to. We're 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 going to have power cords. And this was something that came out of discussions with the with the backers. Went from being a a little source book into being a full fledged rule book. So now power cords, music, magic, and urban fantasy. While it's still open source, and you can still do it with GURPS, or you can do it with Storyteller, or you can do it with D20, or whatever, or you can do it with the the compact system, which is what I developed for um, with with. Um, with Julie and Carl Lepp for Deliria. That's another project and I'll get to that in a moment. But you can use the compact system, but there are rules within, a, a fair amount of rules within power chords for things like how to do concerts, how to get the, the audience on your side. Again, how to deal with drugs because that's a big part of the music business. Um, how to deal with things like backmasking, 
you know, influencing large crowds of people, um, working with different instruments. There's a section on instruments. There's a section on different types of music and what the characteristics of different different genres of music are. It wound up being a much bigger, more comprehensive book than I expected, and I got several other books worth of material out of it, which are also in progress. Uh, there's uh, power power chords. Uh, Mystic Rhythms, which I've been publishing por portions of that on my blog, Sadoros Filbrucato at WordPress.com. Uh, there are a number of installments of my history of magic and music on that. Uh, there's Living the Life, which is made up of the section that I started writing about the about what being a musician is actually like, the stuff that goes into, you know, rehearsal, recruiting bandmates getting signed to a label, rehearsal space, dealing with rivalries, that sort of thing. After that after that section broke 25,000 words, I realized it had to be its own book, so that book is in progress. Uh, there's a, I have a, a, a book of short stories now coming out called uh, Tritone, uh, Sales of Musical Weirdness. That Some of that material came out of Power Chords. Others were stories that were published in Weird Tales and so forth. But in any case, Power Chords is its own series now, and I learned a lot about Kickstarter. One of the biggest ones that I learned, one of the biggest things I learned is don't do a Kickstarter until you've written the fucking book. <laughs> because up until you've written the fucking book, you don't know how much you're going to actually need. Yeah. So, I, other I, pro... I, I, sorry, I said I looked at that when I was looking at doing a Kickstarter for Under a Fire, and it really... Uh... I was like, I don't know how to answer these questions. I don't know how much I'm going to need to do print runs and so forth. So, it, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. It seems like um, uh, it just yeah, seems like there are a lot of potential uh, perils and pitfalls there, uh, putting it together. Of course, a lot. of course, I mean, yeah, it is a nice why, huh? I said it is a nice option to have the ability to, to raise those funds via via that. Oh, meeting. it's marvelous. Yeah, it, it is. It is absolutely marvelous. There are. On a lot of levels, and this is something I want to address real quickly, on a lot of levels, because the role-playing game industry has completely changed from what it was back in the 1990s, there are a lot of people going, oh, paper-based ga paper gaming is dead. No. In terms of the stuff that's coming out right now, in large part thanks to Kickstarter and, and crowdfunding and social media, I think the material that is coming out in terms of paper-based role-playing game is, is more interesting and more creative and certainly more diverse than it's ever been before. You've got role playing out. I've forgotten the name of it off the top of my head, but there's a ki there's there's a Kickstarter uh, in indie game uh, about Africa, African fantasy, which is in the works. There have been several good steampunk games. Uh, there's there are games games like the the the, the, the resurrected uh, witch hunter, which be, despite being a pagan, I think is a very very good game. You got stuff like Kingdom of Nothing and uh, Passages and Hoodoo Blues uh, and Monster Hearts, which are all they're they're genre, but they're they're very good uh, and they're very creative, much more creative actually than you could than you could possibly be back in the days when you had to sell ten thousand units just to make back your production costs. Yeah. So on a lot of levels, the RPG field is is open to a, a level of creativity it's never seen before. I'm very happy about that. Uh, well, well, as someone, who runs, of, I was as someone who runs an RPG channel, pays attention to that trend, who writes RPGs, I think you definitely hit that on the head. There's a tremendous swell of different ideas and possibilities and different voices from uh, you know everything from the, the type of gaming that I, I would definitely not want to do to that deep immersive aspect where you're, you know, you're really getting the character and you're playing and you're acting and you're experiencing and, and really enjoying uh, that aspect of the game. So yeah, I mean, there are definitely new ideas and, and thoughts and voices, but it, it's great to also to see how that can can even affect someone like yourself, who, who's you know an industry icon, to uh, kind of change or maybe even maybe even if you'd say even push you a little bit to go. Oh wait a minute, there's all this new. How do I keep myself fresh? And, and I don't know if you feel that way or not, but uh, yeah, I mean, oh, it does yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's constantly it's constantly a struggle to I wouldn't say a struggle. It's a challenge to constant to to not get to not get stuck in a rut. Sure. Uh, I I know that there are certain things that there are certain tropes and idioms and characters that I keep revisiting and themes that I keep revisiting in my work. But I, I I'm, I'm always working to to keep from being from being pre too predictable from being from getting stuck in a rut. And one thing I can tell you there in terms of pen and paper not 
in my mind, not mean at all, because I think we're going to see a renaissance here that's already begun, that the, the wave is cresting. And Google+, Plus, Skype, vehicles like this, mm -hmm. they're only in their infancy, that will become yeah. vastly better as the years uh, come around. We can mm -hmm. sit there and play, and I think it's particularly for the style, you and I like that, that immersive style, that storytelling, that 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 passion and excitement yeah. that we bring into the game to, to tell that consistency of character, those dynamic changes. And I think that this style, like we're having right here, you know, you can play a game, you get a few people on, and you can really tell their stories, and you can tell them mm -hmm. in front of an audience of thousands of people who watch and go, that's yeah. what it was supposed to be like, oh, and then they learn and they play, and I get it every mm -hmm. single week. Fail. They write me and they go, you know, this is this is what it was. This is what I was missing. This is what we thought it could be. And now it is. I went and I ran and I used these techniques. And now we're doing the best deal ever. And everybody's loving it. And I see a real revolution coming. An RPG revolution. Yeah. As I like <laughs> coming. RPG. 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 That's, right. <laughs> That's right, brother man. But yeah, just, just that. I, that I want to throw a. Uh, I, w I want to throw out a shout out to Zombie Orpheus Productions and and uh, uh, and and the their Dark Dungeons movie, <laughs> which is I believe they are releasing it at Gen Con, and I have seen an early cut of it and it is hysterical. So everyone should go and RPG RPG at Dark Dungeons or with Dark Dungeons. Dark Dungeons, I'll have to check that out. Uh, definitely. Some RPG comedy stuff you very hit or miss. I found. Uh, I love Fear of Girls. Um, if you've seen that one, uh, uh -uh. No, Fear of yet. Girls. Oh, you got to check it out. It's on, it's on YouTube. Amazing stuff. Tom Lommel. Um, uh, it's it's Ed, uh, the director, the same name as my son, Ryan Wood. Uh, Scott Jorgensen. Mm -hmm. So it's very. I've had the guys on. Uh, very 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 funny people. Um, so yeah, definitely, I'll definitely check that. And you guys check that out. You know, you're getting loads and loads of stuff here to check out. Uh, let, let, let's before we get into any other things, so we don't forget. Let, 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 let's hit all, all your plugs. I mean, do you have a Twitter you want to plug? You want to plug your Facebook? You know, how people okay. how follow you? Hang, hang on just a second. I'll go grab one. <laughs> sure. All right. So uh, uh, to fill a moment, while well, Phil, oh there he is. Okay. Hold yeah, on. this is. This is this is the first of several uh, compilations of, of my fiction that are in this. This one is out. You can get this on Amazon.com. You can also get it uh, digitally on uh, Smashwords.com, and it'll be it'll be available for Kindle eventually when we get around to formatting it. Kindle. But uh, but there are two other one one of the things people. People often forget because I'm I'm most known as a game writer. Well, Phil, Phil, but I was a short story over. writer before I was a game writer. <laughs> give us can, show, show the book one more time. Can you give us the price points on it? Did you, did you know this off the top of your head? Oh, I found that always five five ninety five ninety five for a physical copy five ninety five. Yes, and for the uh, the the online copy, I believe is one ninety nine. Oh my God! How can you yeah. not just just go pay pay the six dollars? What's wrong with you people? Go ahead and get get a hold of that right now. That that's a wonderful deal. Yeah, this is, but this it's a. That's collection collection of short stories. I mean, I've I've been published, uh, realms of fantasy, uh, weird tales, uh, meow. Hello, one of my kittens. Meow. Um, Cabinet defeats. Uh, a number of anthologies, uh, the Green Man anthology, and so forth. And so, one of the things you know I, I realized a few years ago was I've got all of these short stories that where the rights are mine. You know, the stuff that I wrote for White Wolf, I don't own the rights to that. It's all work for hire. But my short fiction, there was no reason that I couldn't do compilations of my short fiction. So I've got a series, a, trilo a trilogy of compilations. There's Wild Sight, which is Tales of, Tales of Primal Fantasy, which is not about dino sex. Dino sex wasn't even a thing when that book came out. Um, but it's, it's about uh, wild women and, and uh, wild women in, in the wilderness. Uh, there is... Uh, Tritone, Tales of Musical, uh, Tales of Musical Weirdness, which is stories about musicians and you know oddness and Thor becoming a rock star, uh, the the, uh, the 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 woman who's who's yeah exactly, right uh, a guy who's got a crush on on one of his uh, one of his his uh, music 
uh, is his musician friends, a, a woman who, uh, a traveling musician who, who meets an angel in the, in the green room of a shittiest club in, in uh, Louisiana, things like that. Um, and then there's um, Rootless, which is a story of, of men and I hate to I hate to say masculinity or manhood, but it's it's really about the male fantasy stories about the male condition. There's uh, the legacy box, which is a story about why men don't cry. There's the uh, uh, there's uh, echo chamber in which a uh, in, in in which an, an eager an eager young fantasy fan discovers that there's more going on in his in his favorite publishing company than he realized. Uh, story and, and uh, the the uh, Johnny Sirius, which was was published recently in the the, the Urban Green Man anthology, uh, which is about a uh, of a, a depressed and repressed young man who encounters his his inner wild self, things like that. And so these are we're we're doing them as, as small budget compilations, and we'll be doing a a larger compilation of those plus a number of things, some novellas and so forth. Some of which have been published, some of which has a, haven't called Setting Fire to All My Gods. That'll probably be a year or two before that's out. But in any case, those those, prog those, those things are in progress. I'm also working on a progress called the Dream Dance Oracle with, Ste with artist Stephanie Pullman Law, uh, which is a, an oracle deck, not a tarot deck per se, but an oracle deck, which is based around dance. Uh, both she and I are dancers. We love dance. And, and after she did the tarot deck, uh, her award-winning tarot deck for uh, Llewellyn, uh, her, her editor said, why don't you do an oracle deck? So she, she and I are old friends and old collaborators, and she said, hey, you want to do an oracle deck? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> We've been working on it in between a bunch of different projects, but you can see the, uh, you can see the results of it at Dream Dance, the, the, the Dream Dance oracle section mm -hmm. of shadowscapes.com. Which is the website for artist Stephanie Pullman Law. Uh, that that that's still that's a that's a work in progress, but you can see what we're doing over there. Uh, there is also the compact system, the revised compact system rules. Uh, Eleven years ago, I did uh, my, uh, my my collaborators in Laughing Fan Productions, and I did Deliria Fairy Tales for New Millennium, which for people who haven't heard of it or seen it. You know, I've been meaning to actually have you on for, I will do this at some point here in the coming months, I think, have you on for an actual video about Delirium, because I, I think I, I'd like to make a video we could just talk about Delirium, I think. Yeah, I would love to do that. Uh, this is, unfortunately, the, uh, it wound up in limbo. I was talking, I think it was on me. Show, show them the book one more time. Oh, sure. A little production snap through there. Now, Phil, tell them what the, what's the price point. Now, this is hardback, yes? This is this is hardback, and the price is whatever somebody is charging for it on Amazon at the time. I have two copies of it, and this is one of them. Uh, I am hoping at some point to do a Delirious second edition, but the rights are currently tied up between me and one of my former partners. Hmm. So until I can afford to buy him out, that Deliria is in limbo. I hope not. I hope to not have it in limbo forever. Yeah, However, man. the compact system rules, which I designed for Deliria, those are mine, and I've been working uh, working with a, a brain trust, like is it like like with Mage? I've been working on, with a brain trust to fix and refine those because the core idea of the compact system was a good one. There were problems with its execution. I freely admit that. And but like you said, I learned from my mistakes, and the learning process of that is going to be the compact system rule book, which is going to be a small. Generic, easy to use, um, story, story and character based, as opposed to dice and and rules based uh, system that can be used with with a variety of different genres. You know, it's it's not bound to any particular genre. In fact, I had to explain this to my playtesters at one point when they were saying, "But where's the setting material? Where's the setting material?" I'm like, "There isn't any. This is a generic set of rules." Oh, okay. I'm just grabbing a power cord. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. But that's uh, that's the compact system rules. I'll I'll be I'll be posting more about that as it as it happens. Well, uh, and that, when you get ready to get this stuff, you come on here. We'll we'll give the guys a video. We'll pump it up. We'll get it. We'll get uh, uh, the horror members uh, mobilized. 
to support these ideas, you know, to keep that quality RPG product and the steaming coming out. But Thank you. Killer. I will absolutely rub several. Anything I do to help? Oh, sorry, guys. I said absolutely. Thank you. Anything we do here to help and get to get that uh, get that running Thank out. You. I definitely know that you you have that that proper set uh, of imagination in RPG. Uh, and also, uh, what other uh, what what other things? Are you working on right now? That you might give the people a little sneak peek at before 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 we wrap up here to kind of titillate them. Well, I, I am I'm working on something I can't announce yet. I'll just say this: keep keep your eyes on Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. Zombie. Orpheus. I'm working with them on something I can't talk about right now, uh, and they they will they will announce it when they announce it. But but I'm I'm not at liberty to talk about it. Just watch Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. Uh, and also, I am actually working on novels. <laughs> they just they, the the novels get worked on in between everything else. Got it. That is. And yeah. since everything else is paying the bills, they they get priority. But I do have several novels in progress that have nothing to do with mage or well, they are kind of tied in with with power cords, but but they're they're independent fiction. They're not game fiction. Uh, and I have one that is about halfway finished at this point, which is not tied in with anything else. It's just me being literary and shit. Uh, there, there was my web comic arpeggio, but we had to take that down because it was a money sink, and because Brian, Brian Syme, uh, my my collaborator on that one, is incredibly busy with freelance work at this point. He doesn't have time to keep the uh, to keep the, the the strip going. So, in case anybody's been wondering where arpeggio went, it's because Brian and I are really, really busy. <laughs> We, we do have more episodes from it made. We may or may not actually be publishing them at some point. It, it depends on what happens in the next few years. But we had that for a while, and it was fun. Yeah, it was really and, fun. well, I still write for, uh, for Witches and Pagans magazine. I've been writing for them, the Witches and Pagans magazine or New Witch magazine, which I've been writing for for 12 years now. Uh, I'm st I still... I still write for them, and I still have stories and things appear in various different publications. I just don't have anything to, to talk about at the moment. Well, actually, no, there's... Hang on. Sure. I am wrong. This anthologies just came out recently. Oh, well, there you go. That's something to take a look at here. Have a bit of a look. Yeah, I, I want to... I want to plug these because these are all indie publishers and they deserve to sell wow. copies. Let's get all, get all the plugs in you on, brother. All right, now is this a hard cover or soft? It looks like a hard cover. This right? is this, this is soft cover. Soft cover. It's a sturdy it's, it's, soft cover, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is this is this is from. Give them the Rap. name in case they can't read it. Give them the name. Uh, it's it's where thy dark eye glances, the queering of Edgar Allan Poe. And yes, right. I do write gay. I, I do write gay stuff as well. I don't only write from this from the perspective of of straight straight white dude. Uh, All right. But this is. Uh, this this is a collection of short stories taking taking inspiration from the work of Edgar Allan Poe and, and with uh, with alternate with with alternate uh, alternate orientation and uh, they're they're very very good stories so I highly recommend this please su please support Leaf Press they do very good work uh, there is the Urban Green Man anthology uh, my now, short now, hold story up. Oh. Now, hold up. Well, before you go there where can they yeah. tell them exactly where they can get each of these oh. books. Amazon.com. These know are what all available at Amazon.com, and they are also available at bookstores as well. I couldn't tell you which ones because that depends on the bookstore. Well, but, go uh, to Amazon.com and, and, and have a look. Yeah, these are these are all available on Amazon.com. But uh, this my my story and where the dark eye glances is a take on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Hop Frog, which is one of the darkest stories I've ever written. And I'll just leave it at that. I'll let people imagine what that what that could be like. But it is one of the it's one of the darkest, most disturbing stories I've ever written. Definitely sounds uh, interesting. Uh, there is the Ur the Urban Green Man anthology from uh, from Edge Books. Uh, my story in this is uh, Johnny Serious, which I mentioned earlier in in this discussion. Uh, there, everything in this is good. And there is. Deep Cuts, which is a, a Seattle publication uh, about women in horror. It's not specifically only about female writers, obviously, because obviously I wouldn't be in it if it was. Sure. But it's kind of bring, bringing up darker and well, darker and more disturbing themes in uh, in horror 
this is edited by Angelie McCoy, who is also a, a, a popular White Wolf writer, and uh, she now does the the Wiley Writers Group. Uh, should plug them as well. Wiley, W I L Y, I think, uh, Writers dot com, uh, in which Angel has it's a, it's an online magazine. Angel has a, a wide array of, uh, of very good fiction on there. But, uh, but yes, check those out. They're all available at Amazon.com. And this, this as well, Amazon.com. So that's what I can talk about right now. <laughs> and I should actually go fairly soon because Absolutely. speaking of those projects, I, I, I have a meeting at 4 o'clock. <laughs> 4 uh, o'clock my time. Well, we have uh, uh, definitely appreciated having you on here, Phil, taking us time, walking us through Mage 20, explaining some of this to us, and I strongly encourage everybody out there to go get your copies of uh, all of these games as they're coming out, getting uh, involved with kickstarting his future books. He said he's got a whole bunch, like uh, 10 more. So, I mean, that's certainly, certainly what to have come. you got to put the money out there to get the products to come out, which is going to be really up to you and and and, and yep. you want them you love them do you want to put uh, your money where your mouth is and support quality excellent role playing games with with a, a direct focus and i think that's really well worth the time i have had enormous amounts of fun playing mage and other world of darkness games it's been a, a tremendous source of entertainment in my life now uh, again so uh, thanks for being on here phil you phil is on facebook are you on twitter phil uh, I am not on Twitter. Twitter, right. Twitter is a time sink. I don't have time. <laughs> I, I, I'm I am not on Twitter either. I feel the same way. But yeah, follow. I, I am. I am on Facebook, and I am on uh, uh, the. I mentioned it earlier. Um, my blog is at Smash. Not not Smash. Well, Smash Words. I have books there, but um, naturally, I'm completely blanking because I've been talking for two hours, and I'm forgetting where where my uh, where my blog is. Satoros.wordpress. WordPress. WordPress. <clears throat> Satoros Phil Brucato. S T S A T Y R O S Phil Brucato at One WordPress.com. Word. You, you and there's fine. there are dozens of dozens of articles and essays up there, including my my rather popular uh, uh, Demon Lovers series and the uh, and the the, uh, the and the Mythic Rhythms yeah my, Mystic Rhythms series. Uh, before I go, are there any other questions there? Because I don't, I don't well, want to leave there anybody There are enormous amounts of questions, but I think I, I, I dug through them and picked out a couple. Um, no, okay. I don't. I don't want to keep you here for eight hours answering each and every question <laughs> you want to ask. No, I mean, I was getting lit up on Facebook. If anyone saw me looking down and moving away, it's not because I wasn't entertaining about what Phil was saying. <laughs> I was trying to check your questions out. I pulled. Uh, uh, what did I pull? Maybe five, five, six of them out to ask. Okay. And Phil, you go into such good detail and depth, you know, there's, there's no reason to go through everything in hell. Thank now, you. I mean, at this point, you, you know, you're probably going to give the book away. You know, people go out there and pay your money. Get involved with Mage 20. That's what you want to do, baby. Um, so, and uh, we have we have uh, perhaps something else on this channel exciting. I'm not going to talk about right now in the public eye, if you will, but it might be coming up uh, with mm -hmm. Phil to let you guys see something else about him in the coming months. And with that, I'd just like to thank you, Phil, for taking the time to come here and speak thank myself you. with Barbarian Horror, with the people out there in YouTube land, from, from you know all, all your own fans who've come and jumped over here. And make sure, hey, if you don't watch, check out uh, me normally. Subscribe. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Uh, jump over here. Jump subscribe over here. Subscribe to the main man. man. Subscribe. <laughs> That's right. Follow the main man. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself, baby. Uh <laughs> And you can check out my other two, other two interview videos I've done with Phil. Check out the, the Mage the Ascension. There's a catalog of Mage the Ascension videos here, more than anywhere else on YouTube, uh, on That's the channel. We do support uh, all the oh, World of Darkness yeah. games. I, I forgot to, I forgot to mention talking about the other projects. Uh, if you're in Seattle, check out the Dark Woods exhibition at Crab Jab Studio. Uh, I co-curated that with uh, uh, with Julie Barrow, and we've got some really good work in there, including the first ever exhibit of some work by my partner Sandra Buskirk. Uh, this evening, th rather this weekend, it's this Saturday, and we will also be having live music from Betsy Tinney. So, uh, so if you're in Seattle, come by and check us out at Crab Jab Studios. And you can do that, and that's a great thing. But again, Phil, thank you very much for being here. It was my pleasure to have you on. And thank we'll you. Thank you very much for having here. me. All right. Well, well thank you very much. Everyone Take out care, there. Everybody. Thanks for coming by. Thanks.
thank you for watching. I still see a ton of you viewers out there, so you stuck with us yeah. for however long this was, and we we, we do appreciate it. <laughs> we and, talk and we talk and we talk. Yeah, well, yeah. You got two. You got two classic big mouth guys here that are going to keep talking, maybe, and, and, and try to hopefully <laughs> entertain you as long as we can. Uh, so again, thank you guys for watching, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for supporting RPGs.